Welcome, everybody. Jordan Carroll here, AA, the remote job coach. So excited to be here with you live today. Make sure you drop in the comments wherever you are joining from. We're going to jump right in. If you're watching this, you may have noticed that the word remote doesn't mean the same to all companies who use it. That can be incredibly frustrating because with new models of working in a digital first environment in remote environments, it takes new skills to be successful. It also takes a new approach to targeting the right types of companies that actually put their money where their mouth is when it comes to remote work. I'm really excited to talk about this if you can't tell. And my question to you is, do you work for a remote okay company that allows you to work remotely? Or do you want to work for a remote first company that supports you to work remotely and live your best life? The answer is pretty obvious. So by the end of this session today, you're really going to know how to evaluate a company's remote work style. You're also going to learn how to evaluate your own remote work fluency so that you can attract the right types of companies or even manage and lead successfully within a remote work environment. Uh, I'm going to bring on some guests today, some amazing, lovely guests from the co-authors of Remote Works, Allie Green and Tam Sanderson. Allie and Tam are on a mission to liberate teams from nine to five and teach them how to do their best work anytime, anywhere. They have spent a combined two decades in distributed, fully remote environments, Ali as the former director of people ops at DuckDuckGo. Tam is the director of strategic partnerships and corporate development at Automatic. They believe that remote work skills are the requirement for managers, teams, whoever it is in these ecosystems, regardless of where or what their office looks like. So we're going to talk about all these things today. And I'm really excited because a lot of my audience is job seekers. So if you out there are a job seeker, this is going to be one of those rare opportunities where you get a side of the perspective from someone who's been in a really high position, both in operations, both in HR, in that perspective of what it is that they're looking for in people and their remote work skills, what it is that really defines a great remote work environment. And I know we're going to get a ton of value from these two. So I'm going to bring them out one by one. And just to set the stage, some interesting things about them. Allie, who I'm going to bring out first, she was on an axe throwing league. I don't know if I've ever met anybody on an axe throwing league. So welcome, Allie, whose <laughs> video is no longer working. <laughs> Allie's having some video troubles in France. So when she rejoins us, she can jump back in. So we will bring out Tam and we'll have Allie. Allie needs to explain herself. Uh, for this axe throwing at some point when she gets back on. And then Tam leads a dream group. I lead a dream group. Here's my yeah. face. I love how Allie, like there's actually the little glasses. So it almost looks like she's like invisible. That's her like little setup on your screen. Mm. But yes, I lead a Jungian style dream group uh, every other Monday where we, um, we guide people to a better understanding their dreams. Nice. Oh, Allie's a real person. She's and not Allie's just like, a real person. Here we go. Me, I thought. Hi, Allie. Hello. Allie, explain I'm to so us. I'm so glad y'all can see me now. Yeah. Explain to us this axe throwing. How do you, how does one get into axe throwing? Lisa? So in my early days of being a digital nomad, I would spend five or six months back in my home base of Philadelphia and to prevent myself from getting bored and missing traveling to exotic locations, every time I went home, I joined a new group or club and found myself a new hobby. The most impressive and embarrassing for me of all of them was when I joined an axe throwing league. And it was the very first league in Philadelphia that opened when the axe throwing club opened back, back in the day. And I think I came in last place pretty much every single time, but it was really fun. And it's a cool fun fact to have done that um, while not traveling to cool places, just find a cool hobby. Yeah. And, but you're an OG too. If you were one of the first people an OG. at that place, yeah. Uh, did you accidentally murder anybody? No, I did not. And I took Tam to oh, axe okay. through with oh, me um, when she came to visit me in Philadelphia one year. Yeah. Awesome. Well, speaking of murder, we need to murder these. <laughs> 
fake remote jobs. What's up with all these fake remote jobs? If you are tired yes. of fake remote jobs and you're watching this, put real remote jobs in the chat. So we want to talk about some real remote jobs. And we're going to get into a moment how you can look at companies and you understand how it is that they're actually offering real remote jobs. Um, and let's go back to the dreams, because I think there's a lot of people out here with dreams, a lot of people with remote work dreams and whatever that looks like for however they're at. Uh, I want to talk about one of the first steps to getting to your remote work dream, which is remote work fluency. It's like one of the first things you probably should evaluate, which is in your book. And Tam's shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. So I want to hear, Tam, if you can talk a little bit about how does one like know where they stand with their fluency of remote work and what is it that they can do about it? Yeah. So I love, first of all, that you're starting off with dreams, because I think that's how my remote journey started. Um, in 2004, I'm an elder millennial. I uh, studied abroad in London. And I remember like coming back to school and being like, oh, I have like got to find a job where I can be in Europe. Um, this is like what I'm going to do. So I got a job as a uh, management consultant. And within, I think, like six months of the job, I only took international projects. And that was like the beginning of me trying to find all these like loopholes to being able to be uh, remote. But as you mentioned, a lot of things aren't fully remote. They would still make me come like back mm. to the like, home office a certain amount of time. I still had to um i don't know i still had to like i was it was not a, i had to like kind of wiggle outside the normal realms of the company i worked at versus it being kind of allowed so uh yeah i just had all these dreams and then eventually i became a nomad and was able to kind of fully live remote but i think it starts a lot with that vision you know there's a lot of things mm. to be said about um be able to see things and envision things before they happen but remote work fluency i think of remote as kind of a language and luckily for job seekers especially if you are digital native actually you already have a lot more remote fluency than you think so uh i think one thing is fun so we are on a live chat so if you are here live right now then you are synchronous and you're communicating with us synchronously but if you're watching this after the fact you're already doing things asynchronous and that's like one of the biggest things with remote um but we think with remote frequent uh, fluency a lot of it is uh essentially being in a remote state of mind and so that is questioning a lot of your behaviors and why do things have to be the way they are so it's a lot of asking why 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 and then once you have those questions you start thinking um oh how can i do this differently so that's what i think is the beginning of remote work fluency uh ali tell me your thoughts I think some of the questions that all of the listeners can start asking themselves why on, and not just why, but also how, is think about your own skills and attitudes and behaviors towards work. How many calls a day do you regularly accept in your life that don't have to be a meeting? Do you know how to push back on those? Do you know how you could turn that meeting into something like documentation instead? How do you go about organizing things in a way that's searchable for people? Those are two concrete examples and, and pretty um, widely talked about examples of how remote workers should think about things differently. And uh -huh. if you're already asking those questions of why do I have to be sitting in meetings? Why does this company have requirements of certain time zones? Oh, it's because they expect me to be in a lot of meetings. Well, hey, red flag, maybe that's not a fully distributed company or a remote work company that's going to be right for you. Um, and, and so the more you know how certain behaviors can work in the world of remote, the more that you can know that you have the skill sets already to be a successful candidate and the more you can question how companies are doing things and make sure it's a good fit for you. Mm, I love that. One of the pieces in particular is really around this thought that you can set boundaries around how some uh, certain meetings in your life and certain things that you take as like a Zoom meeting and then you create it as documentation. I like that as kind of a reframe is like, I'm going to use this opportunity of something that could have been this drain of time to create something that is an asset for future. So you're like doing yourself, your future self and the other people's future self, like a huge favor. Did either of you see the meme? It was on Twitter, I think. And it was of the, it was like fake of a Google invite. And then it had the numbers, you know, the salary of each yeah, person. Yeah, the salary of every person. Hour. Yeah. So what did you think about that? Allie, 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 Allie. Uh, oh, I, I used to work at Google and I used to do that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like not that I ever made a meme, but I do remember going to meetings and um, 
calculating people's salary and thinking like, oh, this is a really poor use of everyone's time. So yeah. uh, there's an actually a meme out there. Yeah. So, so just for people who haven't seen it, it's basically like your standard Google calendar invite where it shows all the meeting attendees, but then each meeting attendee has in parentheses how much they make per hour aggregated into the, into the calendar. So then you look at how expensive the meeting is. And it's a really interesting thought process to say, I want to work remote, but I'm actually like adopt remote work. Like, <laughs> like, like the concept of remote work. And I think both of you, you've been in distributed environments in really high positions. And I think one of the most difficult things, like Ali, you just mentioned when you're inside of a company and you're getting all these meeting requests, like, yeah, you can tell it then. And you can start to understand that, hey, maybe a company isn't as remote as they seem. But from the outside in, this is where it really gets tough for a lot of people I work with, like job seekers, is they're evaluating a company from the outside mm -hmm. and they haven't been in the culture yet. So they don't really, you know, there's, there's ways, but I'm curious, like if you, if you were a job seeker in today's day and age, or you were someone who's a manager and you're evaluating whether you should go to this company and take on a team there. Like, what are some of the things that you look for as red flags or good signs that a company is posting a remote job is actually, you know, about what they say? Yeah, so I think a lot of it starts from being analytical at every stage of the interview process. And don't forget that even especially now, there's such a a frenzy um, of attention around the job market and how mm. competitive the market may be that a job interview goes both ways. And so I know when I was sitting on the other side and I was interviewing candidates, there were certain triggers of how we knew they were going to be successful in a remote environment. And it stemmed down to not even things that happened in the interview process, but in their communication back to us. So mm. were they able to communicate very clearly with time zones that they were in so we could adjust accordingly to suggest meeting times. Um, so if you're a candidate and you want to like flip the table, um, I, I would say start looking at all of the little details from the job description itself. One of the biggest red flags for me is if they don't use the lingo consistently. And so I, you know, I, I have a background in people operations, so I still keep up on a lot of what's going on in the job market, especially with remote jobs. And recently I ran into a company where on their careers page, they described themselves as remote first. On their benefits page, they described having free snacks and lunches together in person um, wow. in an office environment. And on the job description, it said that they were they were going to be remote through the COVID-19 pandemic, which feels mm. like old news to me. And already using words like remote during COVID, remote first, um, distributed, but in-person lunches was a red flag because it's like, well, which one of these are you and intentionally why? And so the first question I would tell a job seeker to ask in that environment is how do you define these three words at your company? Um, and yeah. then you can start learning like how they think about those things because right now there's a lot of words that get really hyped up and people throw them around kind of like candy or confetti everywhere and, and you, if you ask a company to define what does remote mean to you um then they have to really give you that answer and then from that answer you can start digging in deeper and asking more questions another big red flag that i'm loving lately because I, I feel like pre-covid it was easier to find a true remote role even though there was less of them and now a lot of people will say that they're remote in a job description. But if you look at the fine print, it'll list a certain like yeah. states or certain countries that they need to hire in. And if you see that, I would say maybe it's for compliance and legal reasons. But then I would ask them, what is your travel policy or your work from anywhere policy in an early stage interview? So you're not wasting your time yeah. where you have to be physically located at home you're not allowed to work from coffee shops or co-working places or things like that yeah i took i took a few things from that and these are really aligned to what i talk to job seekers about which is have being really curious along the along the process and asking a lot of that like having those questions in your arsenal for throughout the entire interview process but especially early and you want to do as much research as you can beforehand so that you're disqualifying any company that's like an obvious no fit where 
there are words that are different across the different places where they post jobs or different ways that they describe themselves. And I think that that's a great thing within the research process to tell is like, look at that website, look at that career page, look at um, every, look at the job description, read through the fine print, like don't leave anything to chance because I've had, I've had people who have gone through like two, two rounds of interviews and it's like remote us and they'll get to that interview, that second or third interview. And they're like, okay, are you willing to relocate? I'm like what? What do you mean relocate? You said remote US. And like, oh, well, you know, like with, within the next six to 12 months, we, we're probably going to be going back to the office. And it's like, oh my God, like, how, how, it seems like such a bait and switch. But uh, Tam, anything that you want to add to that? Yeah. So I think um, a couple of things to add is if you are interviewing with the hiring manager and that is going to be actually the person managing your team, start asking questions about how they run their team meetings. Like, what is, how do they communicate? Um, how, how do they like to work? Because I think essentially within an organization, you really want leadership to actually be on board with remote and like actually legitimately on board. So for example, I used to work at Automatic. So that's an old school, all remote company. And um, Matt, who was the founder, he wanted to be remote. He loves being remote. He does not want to be in the office. And so I think that is actually a really good signal if you mm. can see that your manager likes being remote or their manager likes being remote or the CEO likes being remote, because uh, then it's more likely that they're going to continue with that cultural behavior. Um, but if you're seeing these companies that are kind of like they're doing remote, but they don't really want to do remote and you can tell by the CEO if they're going on, I don't know, different conferences and saying actually remote work is not a really good thing. It's really bad for new and young mm. workers, et cetera. Then that's probably not the place you're going to want to be. Um, and I would also just ask like, questions on what a day-to-day -day looks like. I love when people tell me their like wake up schedules or I don't know, really a lot of details on like how they structure their life. But you can ask a hiring manager that like, how would I spend my week? Or how do you spend your week? How many, um, how do you usually communicate? Are you mostly on Zoom calls or what are your hours like? Is there something, of, um, can I work a non-linear day? I think starting to ask those questions will mm. help you piece out or parse out whether you're essentially doing a copy and paste of the office on a screen. Cause I don't really think if you are doing eight to five on a zoom screen all day, every day, I don't really think that's a very high level of autonomy or a high level of remote work functioning. So those are some things I would just start asking and just yeah. kind of, um, yeah, digging into before signing up. Yeah. I think having a leadership really evaluating leadership is, is such a, a critical element because if you have, even at, like if you have a company like uh, a Duist or like a GitLab or any of these companies that have an actual head of remote, for instance, like that's like a big thing to look look for now, right? As more and more companies are adopting uh, people operations and they're thinking about how they're structuring remote operations and remote policy and they're actually having someone lead that, like that's a huge sign for me too. And I love the fact that, yeah, if you've got a CEO or you've got management uh, uh hiring managers whatever like they're remote or they're like traveling living their life like that's a really good sign too uh who do who are other companies that you both think are making remote work ali any uh ones you want to shout out well i would say obviously duck duck go as someone who led their their people team for so many years why i like to give them a shout out is because uh, as a privacy oriented company, they're not as loud as they should be about how many things they do really well um, mm. with remote work strategies, um, like location agnostic pay, for example. Um, and as a lot of companies aren't hiring, I know there's open roles there. Um, mm. And then I think there's a lot of interesting um, companies coming up like uh, in the like smaller companies that are starting remote. And I, the names escape me of any specific examples right now, but I do think if you're following another great strategy is to follow VC um, communities, venture capitalist communities, and look at when companies are starting to get their initial seed rounds of funding and going to check and see if they're remote and getting in early at those companies. Um, especially if they're going through someone like Union Square Ventures is um, a VC community that does a lot of learning and development. And so that's great for a job seeker to go into a company that has that support um, 
So, so the, those are alternative ways of finding remote companies besides the like remotive.com and, and all of those other lists of really great companies and great job opportunities. Yeah, and I'll add a couple other sources. So we recently partnered with an organization that has this thing called a Flex Index. Uh, their organization is called Scoop. But they've, I think they've taken like 4,000 companies, 100 million employees, and they've basically just done a survey of which ones are like fully remote, employee choice, hybrid. If it's hybrid, do they have to come in on a certain set of days like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, et cetera, and then fully in the office. And what I really like about that is you can start doing filters and start seeing which ones are actually remote and then look at their websites. It's a really nice way to also find those smaller companies. Uh, because like when they were doing their research, they basically found that fully remote companies tend to skew much more on the like SME side. I think on average, they're about like 150 employees. And so those might not be companies you've necessarily heard of, but they could have a really cool, interesting culture. Uh, as an example, when I worked at Automatic, which owns like WordPress and Tumblr, et cetera, I found out a lot about a lot of like really amazing WordPress agencies. And most of those are also remote first. And so um, human made, 10 up, um, Alley Interactive. There's a lot of cool ones like that that do really interesting remote work. Um, and similar to the Flex Index, there's also, I think it's called Flexa Careers, and it's a similar one for the UK and Europe. But I would suggest like looking through those and just starting like popping on their websites and you can find out about these really interesting cultures in places that you may not have thought of working. You don't have to work at a company that has 100,000 employees. You can work somewhere that has 20 and you're probably going to have a lot more freedom and flexibility to uh, make a change in their culture. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I'm getting these links for people in the chat. And I also, when Ali was talking about uh, funded, funded companies, one that came to mind was remote first capital too. That's uh, 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 funding that's come from uh, Andreas Klinger and they they only look at um, obviously remote first companies, so that might be an interesting place to keep up with with some companies. There's a lot of sites out there to to look at. I think doing your due diligence and what what I often tell people is like having a really clear focus on what it is that you can do from an experience and skills perspective. What it is that's your ideal lifestyle. So what are the things that you require in your remote life to um, to be happy? Uh, so that you know what kind of requirements you can stand and then getting really clear in the industry. And if you can, like the size of the company and things like that, and just the more specific you can be, the easier it is to like whittle this down into a list that you can actually manage and then start networking and start uh, you know, formulating your personal brand, things like that. So I want to get to some other things more personal about you two as well, uh, as far as like, your time managing because you both spoke about past roles that you've had. I'm curious when you were in those roles, managing teams, you know, part of distributed organizations, like what do you, what would you say were like your biggest failures and learnings from that? And maybe start with Ali. Yeah, for me, um, the biggest learnings was you need to get behind self-awareness when it comes to time zones and honor boundaries um yeah. a remote company will be good at being flexible with moving meetings around or canceling those meetings for a preference of asynchronous communication as i said when i first started managing remotely I was in the height of my digital nomad life as well. And I was a really fast paced nomad. Every three weeks I was going to a different country and yeah. sometimes it was between different continents as well. And I didn't want to have the stigma that being a digital nomad would make me not as professional of a manager as some of the other people sitting on the executive team. And so it was very rare that I said no to meetings, even though mm. they were like way beyond my bedtime. And I fell asleep and missed meetings in my early days of, of learning what happened. And what I learned from that was most people are very understanding when that happens. Don't let it happen more than once. Um, and own your boundaries. Like I am yeah. not a night 
I'm not a night owl. So the fact that I was sometimes saying yes to having meetings starting at midnight was just like not okay. And what I learned as a manager is like sometimes it also was just a default from the other person and they weren't thinking intentionally about Mm. it. And so when I sat down and said, hey, what is your going back to Tam's question? Like, what does your normal week look like? And some people would say, oh, I get up really early and I like to do a bit of work with coffee so that I can take a break and walk my kids to school. And then I would say, actually, that's really great for me because when I'm in this set of countries, our time zone difference is so large that when you're getting up early, for me, it's early evening and we can have a call then. Um, Or some people that like to work in the evening and I would be in time zones that were a lot earlier than I normally would be in. And I could say, hey, can we like catch up? after you have dinner, um, Mm. just for like, you know, our our one on ones. And so really learning about the people you're working with and their working style preferences was the biggest like lesson learned in terms of like, don't make assumptions about other people, know yourself, set boundaries. Yeah. And is that part of the, uh, the remote work uh, collaboration kickoff? Is that kind of that's that sort of thing is meant to get that aligned? Or how do you get that aligned? I would definitely say the collaboration kickoff and and you don't have to wait till you get the job to do that. I think you can start having the aspects of a collaboration call in the hiring manager interview, as Tam was saying on things like how would you normally give feedback? What are the one on ones look like and make sure that the the personal values that you need in work um, will match up with the manager and the team that you're working with, knowing that that manager might change. But how is it normally done in the company? And this concept of self-awareness is really weaved through the whole book. And so things like energy tracking, do you actually know if you're a night owl or not? For me, it took having to sleep through a meeting to learn I'm not a night owl. Um, Mm. There's other ways to learn before you actually do that and don't make the same mistake that I did. And so we do things like energy tracking. Um, There's like an exercise similar to Mad Libs um, where you can really ask yourself these questions of like, who am I as a remote worker? And how will that fit into my potential team as a job seeker or my current team as an employee? Yeah. So I think taking a step back, what I really take from all that is, is again, the self-awareness piece and how important it is to know what your boundaries are, know what it is that's important to you. And that kind of goes back to that ideal lifestyle. So if you don't know what that ideal lifestyle looks like, if you can't visualize what a great day looks like, then start there maybe with just figuring out what is it that looks like a great day and if that and a great work day right and if that means that work is a great way or day work i is, think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think a, you're a great, right to begin with a great day yeah, 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 and then yeah, work fits day. into it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly um well i would have say <laughs> a lot of people might say a great day when it's like okay i have a great day it's like ideal i have no responsibilities I this. but the reality is is like work fits into whatever that great day is like you said so like for me similarly like i can't do the night stuff like and i there was a a point in my life where i was traveling in asia and i was working us hours and i was doing calls like sales calls like multiple sales calls middle of the night like i'd have to actually have a shift from like 12 to 3 a.m and i was just like yeah i was there for like a couple (laughs) weeks yeah i was not my best day and i was there for a few (laughs) weeks and i was like man this is just not going to work for me. And I love the idea of, you know, setting boundaries, but it really does come from management too, Ali. So you being in a position to be a leader and say that, Hey, these are the boundaries that I have that gives people permission too. So I think that's, what's really important about finding a company um, that will give you that ability to do that because the management actually understands. And then your responsibility as a remote worker, as a employee who has a manager or whatever, is to take those other opportunities to, to do the documentation, like you said, right? Like for is like not ask your, like not get into the habit of asking other people for meetings when there are ways that you can just document things and, and, and get those done. So Tam, I'm going to go back to you. Mistake, yeah. failure. Um, so learning. I think two things that um, I definitely learned, I think one was, so my role um, generally was, 
in the cost, like in between both automatic and external companies that had a very different culture. So I was doing strategic partnerships and I was doing corp dev and we were raising funding. And what I noticed is a lot of times I'd have an easy time kind of working within our little system within automatic yeah. and put stuff on our yeah. blog posts and not send emails and no meetings. But then I would be trying to get, for example, let's say we want to do an integration of an API and we're working with Google's uh, developer team and automatics developer team. And Google's team definitely wants to have a meeting because their culture was very meeting centric. And then automatics, like we never want to meet with anybody. We don't do meetings. And so I was kind of this weird in between place where I could carry uh -huh. the conversation only so far because I am not an engineer. So I could talk about how the APIs would go together and how the product might fit and like this vision for the partnership. But when it came to actually like, how are we going to launch the code? I like needed somebody else to help me. Yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I would try to get automaticians to join uh, calls and they'd be like, we never want you to invite us to this ever again. <laughs> and I was like, ah! Um, and so they were like, we don't do these calls. Like, this is really annoying what you're trying to get us to do, Tamara. Um, and so I did eventually find a way to work around that because uh, I don't like, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I'm a bit of a people pleaser. So that was not uh, the feedback I was necessarily looking for. And yeah. so yeah, there was like two workarounds. One is uh, I ended up getting a lot of our external developers. So whether they were at, you know, Amazon or, you know, Google or different companies, I would actually have them set up uh, both a Slack channel so that they could talk in text back and forth with each other. And I also had them set up a P2 so that um, the two companies could collaborate in written asynchronous communication. So rather than trying to get autom automaticians to go to this meeting style, let's always get on a Google Hangout, I tried to get these other cultures to embed mm. the way autom automatic was working. And then the second thing I did was like, okay, well, at least let's do something fun. And so I'd be like, hey, we're all going to go to Google IO. We're all going to go to F8. We're all going to, we're going to get all these companies to come to WordCamp Europe and Belgrade. And so by having all these developers get to take like a fun trip somewhere and like rent a house together and have them then talk about like all the different coding and all that they could do, they got a lot more excited Mm. And then they wanted to participate. And so those were the two ways I got around these kind of culture clashes when working between two companies. And then the second thing I would say is um, when I moved to a more kind of traditional company to a very flexible all remote company, I was like loving the flexibility. And that's like all I dreamt about and all I wanted. And so I immediately like sold everything I own, put everything in a carry on bag and headed to like Portugal, which is what one does when they start being a digital nomad. And I was yep. waiting late and getting to do this whole thing about curating my schedule. And it was great for me. But what I noticed is a lot of my anxiety came with like not getting responses right away, because I loved being asynchronous and getting to do my work at my own time. But I wanted other people to respond to me right away. <laughs> and so there's mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety I had when I was like waiting for responses. And I'd be like, Oh, like, what are they? What are they thinking? What did they how did they respond? When are they going to respond? And so um, my coach at the time, who's also featured in our book, he gave me this great quote that I think of a lot um, by Viktor Frankl, and it's between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. Uh -huh. Our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so I just had to learn of like putting my full response out there and letting there be space for that other person to respond and having to move on to something else. Yeah. And that's very simple. But I think actually that is one of the key things of becoming more and more comfortable with remote is releasing a lot of that control. And that is very, very hard for humans to do. Yeah, it seems like both of you come at this remote work stuff, which is kind of how I do it with a lot of like intention and mindset work, and like Buddhist practices, maybe. Uh, which I think, <laughs> which I think, Tam, you yourself described the Buddhist uh, <laughs> design thinker. Uh, we'll get to that soon, but I just think it's so important. Like we go back to the self awareness piece. We go back to like the space in between stimulus and response. We go back to all these things. It's like all this just comes back to great levels of self awareness, like truly. And for you to be successful in, in remote work. Like having that as your foundation is so helpful. Um, I wanted to move to a concept that you talk about in the book. It's called digital house. 
So Ali, you want to start and tell me what a digital house is and where, like, how do I, or if Ali's with us, <laughs> is Ali frozen? <laughs> Either she's really she's still, or she's very still. Uh, I can start off with this. So okay. uh, actually, so digital house, it was like coined in one of the interviews. So we interviewed 35 other remote experts for our book which I found really fun because, as I mentioned, I do a lot of kind of desi design thinking work. I used to work for IDEO, so I love interviewing people and, like, understanding where they're coming from and synthesizing it. Um, but she was just saying that, you know, in this physical world, we're so used to all these cues of what to do and how to behave. Uh, she specifically was working at the University of Edinburgh at the time, so she talked a lot about you go to a lecture room and you know based on how it's set up if you're going to sit back and take notes or if it's kind of a conference style table then you're going to have more of like a seminar or a discussion uh you know that when you're in the hallway you have casual conversations with your friends if you're at the local pub then you're like doing things that are more social within kind of the campus and so with that idea we also talked about how there's so many of those cues in the physical work world as well and so you know, you have a water cooler and you have a conversation around it. You go to your desk and you send emails, you go to a conference room. But when everything is kind of flattened into a screen and pixels, it's really hard to know what to do. And I think that's actually why if you look at the way that they built a lot of the Internet software early on or like if you look at Microsoft, there's a reason why you have like a trash can is a symbol which is from mm. the physical world and they put it online or you have a desktop and that's, you know, it came from having a physical desktop and you have a desktop on your computer because we needed to have this orientation. And so we believe the same thing has to happen if you're gonna do remote work well, you have to know where to do different things. Like what Slack channel do you have this chat on? And you know, how should we be sending communication messages? And if your whole team went on vacation for a week, you should still be able to do your job because everything should be located somewhere, documented online in an easy to find place. So in that chapter, we talk a lot about getting your like digital house in shape because often I think a lot of our kind of work worlds look a lot like the junk drawer. I don't know if you had mm -hmm. a junk drawer growing up, but it's like oh, yeah. random menus and like all the stuff. Rubber that you bands, have. paper clips. Yeah, rubber bands, um, all of that kind of stuff. And so we we have like a concept that is kind of taken from Marie Kondo, um, the art of tidying up. You kind of need to start thinking like, okay, I really want to get this place in shape. I want to go into this workspace that will bring me joy every day. How can I start organizing and have these simple rules so it's really easy for me to navigate and do my work? So I'm not always searching around and finding out like where I need to do things and where things lie because that creates a lot of context switching and a lot of confusion. Mm. Ali, I'd love to hear some of your perspective on those rules maybe or any you know, examples or things that you can elaborate on. Yeah, I'll build off that. Um, I think one simple rule that is really meaningful is how are status updates given in a company? And so that's one a great question to ask as a job seeker and you're trying to understand how a company is. And as a manager, when you're trying to figure out how to create processes internally, that's another, the same question is great to ask. So how do we share process updates internally? Your simple rule could be, well, it needs to be readily available to anybody when they're starting their work. Um, so it needs to be vast in reach. It needs to be asynchronous by design. And it needs to be actionable because people need to see the status update and know if they're a stakeholder, if there's a roadblock mm -hmm. that needs to be unblocked or if things can move forward. And so the, the simple rules are easy to understand the audience um, is vast and it is actionable. And so you might decide, okay, these simple rules, we're going to create a template in Asana where everybody can put in their project updates. And that template will be used by everybody and people can chime in if they have questions throughout a 24 hour period, making it an asynchronous ritual that grounds everyone throughout the week. And, and so that's how you can think of simple rituals. And um, building them as well as trying to figure out if companies are thinking that intentionally. And for you to learn how to do those skills on your own, if you're not yet working in a company, create simple rules for yourself in your own mm. digital house. So we all use tools personally, email, LinkedIn, your, your job search, how are you documenting where you are with certain companies, um, what their response is? Um, do you have a centralized location with all um, your CV information? with the types of feedback that you're getting, if you're getting any feedback, how are you interacting with your tools? What are the simple rules you're creating for yourself? And that will build the muscle before you even enter a company. 
And you can then speak to that as well as how someone who knows how to navigate through different tool suites using things for a specific purpose. Yeah, I think that's so important if you're not within a current team that does a lot of this stuff, like to get your experience with your personal life at least in doing this or trying to bring it into a team, obviously, if possible. But if you're just an individual contributor or just someone who's... Um, you know, being able to use this on your day to day in your job search, like really thinking, how can I apply the concepts now so that when I'm in an interview, when I'm at the time where I'm actually gonna have to preview what it's like to work with me, like I actually know what they're talking about. And I've actually had a little bit of experience navigating some of these things. So I think that that's, that's uh, super important. I'm also big into Asana, like I use Asana for my business. So I'm curious, just this is a selfish thing. Uh, <laughs> what, what's, uh, if, if both of you had like one sleeper tip about Asana, like using Asana in some way that no, like most people don't think about or is like overlooked, what would you say, if anything? I don't know if it's a sleeper hit, but I create templates in Asana by having recurring tasks that have specific headers within them. And then every time I close out one task, the new task populates with the same information and I can delete the content in each header. Deleting yeah. the content helps me confirm with myself or my team that we actually don't need this information anymore because we have it in mm. the previous week. And so it's that kind of natural gut check in a process. And then the new headlines remain. So I don't have to double think like what information does the team need? What am I supposed to be including here? It just removes a lot of the, the overthought and guesswork. So I use recurring tasks as much as I can for templates. Mm. And so then they're recurring, but they're not like assigned or yeah. they don't have a due date or you'd have to have a due date for it to be recurring, right? You need to have a due date for it to be recurring, but it, opens up again once you close it out so right. you can put an ideal due date in there it doesn't have to be strict okay. and then you can assign it to different people each new time it doesn't have to be consistently okay. so the old the old people. version the old version that you've completed is the old version of a template essentially yeah. yeah love it okay cool yeah asana heads here tam anything <laughs> or should we move on um, we're losing like people <laughs> Yeah. Hello, Asana fans. Uh, I think there's two I things. forced Asana on Tam a little bit. Yeah, so. so I actually tried to use Asana at previous companies, and I was told by IT that I was not allowed to use those because we had to use only internal software. So I am mm. new to Asana since working with Ali. Uh, for whatever, at Automatic, all of our stuff was done on WordPress blogs for the most part, so I didn't use Asana. I know some teams did, but that was not kind of my world at Automatic. Um, but two things. One is um, I turned off the email notifications from Asana because I started getting overwhelmed that I was getting too many notifications. Both I was getting like a notification on my phone and a notification in my email. And I was also getting like a pop up in my computer. Yeah. And I felt really overwhelmed by being notified so many times about a task. So when I turned all of those off, it actually made it much easier for me to attend to my Asana inbox. And I treated it much more of like, okay, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to, you know, archive once I've done these tasks. And it made it a lot more zen than when I felt like there was too much demanding mm -hmm. my attention. The second thing I would recommend is have as much of your conversation in one platform as possible. So what I really like about how Ali and I use Asana is we don't really have that many other tools. We use WhatsApp a little bit if it's it's mostly personal when we just like catch up and it's usually yes. something immediate. It's like, Hey, can you respond to this email right away? Cause they're asking for something in five minutes. And that's the only time we really use WhatsApp or other text message stuff for our work. For the most part, everything's in Asana or we write stuff in Google docs. And by just having it all there, it's so much easier to find conversations. So right now we're doing a lot of stuff with our taxes, which is obviously like the most fun thing ever. Um, and so it's really nice to be able to just like search in Asana and we can have all the notes and the, the receipts and all of that versus trying to go back later. And that was actually something I found incredibly powerful when I moved to Automatic is they had archived everything since the very beginning in 2005. Mm. And I remember I reported to our um, general counsel and he was like, yeah, this is like a lawyer's nightmare. It's like the worst thing you could do is have every single thing physically documented for discovery. Uh, but from an employee standpoint, it was incredible because I always felt like I was like omnipresent. Like I had all of this history and all this knowledge. I would go into a partnerships meeting and be like, okay, here's every single time we've ever talked with your company. Here's every single 
single thing we've ever implemented. Here's every discussion uh -huh. we've had. And I found it actually incredibly ironic that my team at Google had been working with Automatic before I moved there. And I actually knew more about the partnership by reading the details on Automatic's blog about a year later than I ever knew when I was on the team within Google. And so the more that you can document, the better it is. Cause like now I know that people at Automatic are still reading my P2s from when I left like three years ago, they can still have the information that I learned when I was there. And so it, it, I just think there's so much value of having that continue on and those voices and those ideas uh, be properly archived with an organization so it's not all lost through you know conversations yeah. and you know things that are forgotten 100 percent um yeah it keeps coming back to like just constant documentation too for for you to be valuable in a lot of these circumstances like the more that you can document the more valuable you are um we got about 10 minutes left so i want to make sure we get through at least a few more of these ali you had talked about the business world using the word manager and leader wrong. So what is it that they're doing wrong? What, what are the ways that managers and leaders need to unlearn definitions? And does someone have to be a manager in a manager role to be a leader? Yeah, I love all of these questions. So I think traditionally, people thought about manager and leader very differently. Like there's all this um, very like interesting research and, and written opinions around how leadership is somehow like better than on the level up from management, which I also think is not the right way to think about things. And I think the evolution of why that happened is because in history of companies, the manager was the person making sure like you showed up on time, your work was getting done, approving you for things like paid time off. And this person was seen as a gatekeeper for a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the manager's role moving forward. And and then a leader came in and the leader got to be this beautiful butterfly and, and the leader was like charismatic and, and shared a vision with people. And um, by doing that, I think it created tension between the true definitions of these two words. Whereas when, when we describe these things and in our book, we actually talk about manager in four different ways. We talk about it in terms of the activities, the skills and the competencies you need to perform in a certain role within an organization. And so the one I want to speak to the most is project manager. That used mm. to be a specific job. Moving forward, everyone who works remotely is going to be a project manager because yeah. as we've talked about for, for uh, most of the, the session today, documentation is super important. Having the self-awareness to follow up on deadlines is super important. You need to have project management skills to know how to document things and to document things in a way that people can read and find and follow up on that they're actionable. And, and so knowing those skill sets and being thought of as a as a project manager, even if you don't have that title, is going to be true for every single person working in a remote organization moving forward. And it's also nice to think about these things so that you can start breaking down in your head, have I ever had anything to do with these roles? Or do I currently have anything to do with these roles? And in what context? So the other three that we talk about besides project manager is obviously like a people manager, but not from the sense of are you telling this person yes or no, but do you know how to coach someone and help them get to the next level of their career? Do you know how to remove mm -hmm. emotional roadblocks that they're facing that's impacting them on how to get their work done? Do you know how to connect them to different people in the organization where they need to learn information or or build their their external team outside of your nuclear team, whether it's like design or engineering, so that they can feel like they have a sense of belonging at work. And then things like strategic leadership or cultural leadership, and those can happen at any level of an organization. So you think about a brand new employee that's been a digital, like a digital um, native and has huge familiarity with all these tools, they can culturally influence and therefore culturally lead how the team interacts with different tools, how they get their work done, help that shift from say synchronous to asynchronous. And, and same as a strategic leader, it doesn't always have to be a leadership team anymore. What we're seeing kind of hand in hand with remote companies is, is flatter organizations, more transparent organizations. And if you've gotten really good at questioning things and having self-awareness, 
you likely have skills where you can question projects and, and ask things in yeah. a way where even leadership teams might be more open-minded to say like, why are we working on this now? Like, is this the best use of our time, our energy, our resources? And I think those are skills that anyone can bring to the table and therefore everyone can be bits and pieces of a manager and a leader. You just wear different hats at different times. Yeah. Mm. Love that. Um, in the interest of time here, I want to give both of you a chance to give us a lightning bolt. So a lightning bolt of something from the book that you feel like was maybe your favorite takeaway or favorite thing that you're like, I'm so glad that we get to give this to people. Just like one, one thing. And maybe it's something that's surprising or maybe it's something that pe- a lot of people think about or maybe it's just kind of a nugget that uh, this audience can take. And Tam, do you have any thoughts of what that would be for you? Ooh, I know what Allie's going to say, so I'm probably not going to take that. <laughs> and I'll see if you can react. Um, I think my favorite part actually is, I really like the beginning. We use this framework called the um, five W's in one H. It's like who, what, when, where, why, how. And it really allows people to investigate like what's really changed. Uh, Mary Meeker used to have this like really awesome tech presentation. And she would talk about tech like then and now. And she would like, you know, they used to do this. Now we do this when there was so much change going on in the first like 20 years um, of this century. And there's more change to happen, but I felt like there's like so much that was going online at that moment. And we tried to do the same thing. So like who you worked with, how has that changed? Like when you work, how has that changed? How you work, has that changed? And I love using that framework because I think it's so important for somebody to find a personal reason of why they want to work remotely. Because unless you do that, you're not going to be as invested in like, why should I do this? And so by finding one thing that you can really like hold on to, like, oh, this has changed. I love having having a nonlinear day or I love being able to work in a really comfy, homey environment or I love being able to work from my. So, for example, in the summers, I go back to Texas and I run this thing called Camp Sanderson, which means I get to be a camp counselor again. My brother goes on vacation and he leaves me with his four children. And oh, wow. so he's like um, my parents help. So it's not just me, but um, <laughs> we like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we like do face painting and we go to like the water park and we make camp t-shirts. We have a camp song. It's like a full on thing. And like, I would not be able to do that with remote work. Like it allows me to be in other places and get to actually see my nieces and nephews grow up, even though I don't live physically near them. And so I just find it so important to find that like one thing of why remote work matters to you. And once you've found it, then you're going to be a lot more for creating a life to enable that thing to continue to happen. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Allie? I feel like I want Tam to answer for me because I'm curious what she was going to say. I was going to say energy tracking. Oh, I do love energy tracking. But yeah, so energy tracking is is a a tool to help with self-awareness of what boosts your energy and what triggers you have throughout the day. Um, Why I like that, and I think the lightning bolt in general for the book is that it's highly interactive and it's customizable to your unique situation. And so by reading through the book and doing the reflection questions and the activities, you really get to curate how you want your remote work experience and therefore your life to be. So instead of us telling you what we think will work, we lean on our lived professional experiences, stories from other people, but ultimately it's a way for us to help you co-design that. And Mm. I think that's the biggest lightning bolt is that remote is not one size fits all. You have to find what works for you. Yeah, I love that. And some of the, like, what makes it interactive, we have, like, reflection questions. We use Mad Libs. I don't know if anybody did Mad Libs growing up, but you put, like, Yeah, I love Mad Libs. Um, so we have that, we have quizzes, we have like fun manager types that are after like bands and music. It's just, we wanted it to not feel stuffy and full of jargon. So we talk as if you're just our friend and this is what we've learned and you're going to do great things too. And so, um, we want to take a different voice in a traditional management book. That's awesome. Any, uh, additional people that should read this book and like, what would you say? This book is for anybody who's on a team, um, I would say, or is aspiring to be on a team. 
based off of our definition of a manager, if you're going to be involved in leading your own projects, if you're going to be involved in working with a group of stakeholders in a remote or hybrid setting, if you're going to lean on tools and technology to get your job done, then this book is going to help you be more effective and efficient in doing all of those things. Awesome. Um, so everybody else who wants to snag a copy, uh, I'm going to put the book copy uh, or a book link in the different destinations. What I'm realizing is that there are like LinkedIn, like you can't, <laughs> like the comments don't work. So I got to go re-add some of the comments here that I've left in LinkedIn, make sure that um, people are getting the links because there were some questions in there we didn't get to. But um, yeah, well, I appreciate both of you being on here and being part of this so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Thank for having you. us. And thanks for and everybody else. In. Yeah, everyone else out there, keep those remote dreams alive and keep wandering. <laughs>